We've covered a lot of ground in this set of videos. Um, let's see if we can't apply them to some actual word problems. So let's start off with a diagram that goes all the way back to a visual calculus, namely the relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration. And just to briefly remind you, we move from position as a function of time to velocity as a function of time by looking for the slope of the position graph at a particular point in time. That's what this symbol uh, indicates. Similarly, we can use the graph of velocity as a function of time to find out what the acceleration is as a function of time by looking at the slope of the velocity graph at a particular point. We can also work in the opposite direction, if you will. Namely, given acceleration as a function of time, we find the signed area under the acceleration curve plus optionally an initial condition to determine the velocity at a particular point in time. And that same process repeats itself when we find the signed area under the velocity curve and optionally an initial condition to compute the position as a function of time. So with that, we're going to try four word problems that will require us to use the FNINT and N deriv uh, functions. Here we are. Let's just walk through these. So you have someone riding a bicycle, going to school. It takes them 12 minutes to get to school. And we have their velocity. So the question is, how far away does this person live from school? Well, we find the area under the velocity curve over this period of time, this 12 minute period, from 0 to 12, and that will give us the distance between 0 and 12 in time, which is going to give us the distance to school. So let's try that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the signed area from 0 to 12 of the given velocity function pi over 15 sine of pi over 12t. Now don't ask me where this particular function came from. And we'll use the graphing calculator to give us a pretty accurate approximation for this. Let's go over there. So I've entered the velocity formula as a function of time here into y1. Note a couple of things. One, I'm always working in radians in a calculus problem unless something very explicit is specified. And notice, too, that even though this velocity is a function of time, I'm using x for my variable. That's very typical. Again, there's nothing magical about the letter x. We're just saying that that's our variable rather than representing it with a t. So now what do I need to do? Well, I need to um, find the sine area. We know that that's math 9. And here we have the graphical representation, but we could have used the FNINT written representation as well. Our time interval goes from 0 up to 12. The function that we're working with, we've already stored in y1, and that's a behavior that I encourage, even though, of course, you understand, I hope, that you could simply have put in the function directly right here, rather than putting it in y1 and then referencing it. And the variable that we're working with respect to, since we put the y1 formula in in terms of x, is, uh, is x rather than t. So let's just see what amount we get. Well, the answer is 1.6. Uh, looks like Larry lives 1.6 uh, miles from school. 
I probably should have noted that this velocity was in um, miles per minute. Okay, try another. We've got this uh, big hot air balloon rises up from the ground and they're giving us the height as a function of time. Now they want to know what the rate of ascent is. So height as a function of time is the position. The rate of ascent is a velocity. And so we need to find the slope, if you will, of the position function when t equals 8. So let's go over to the calculator. You know, I should have written this in previously. I'm just going to write that in for completeness sake. And let's go on to problem two. All right, well, we've got a formula. We need to put that into y1. And that formula is... put in one half t squared. I'm going to do it as 0.5. And then again, I'm using x to represent time. So there's our formula, one half x squared. Now let's go back and look at this problem. What they're giving us is the height x of t. What they're asking for is v of t. So I'm going to need to use the in -deriv function to evaluate that at 8. Well, let's go there. Okay, I'm using math uh, 8. And I'm doing this with respect to time, but I'm going to say x because I wrote my height formula in terms of x. And we'll use y1 and we need to know this at t equals 8. The answer is 8. So what I'm going to say is t one half t squared right at t equals 8 is in fact 8 and that would be 8 meters per second. Okay, let's try problem 3. Okay, so now we have a buoy and it's bobbing up and down in the ocean. Okay, so it should come as little surprise that it bobs up and down according to some sinusoid since that's a great way of modeling oscillating behavior. And they're giving us the velocity formula, one-third sine of 2 pi over 5t. Again, don't ask me where we came up with that formula, but it's not an unrealistic formula in meters per second. Now we need to know whether at t equals 6 seconds, the speed of the buoy is increasing or decreasing. Well, they gave us velocity as a function of time. We need to, in order to know whether speed is increasing or decreasing, we need to also find the acceleration as a function of time. And we need to compare the sign, whether positive or negative, of the acceleration with the sign, whether positive or negative, of the velocity to determine whether the speed is increasing or decreasing. All right, so let's... Um, Let's first find out whether the velocity is positive or negative. So I'm going to say uh, one third sine of two pi over five t evaluated at t equals six. Let's find that. We'll put the formula in where it belongs. And I'm just going to write that for simplicity's sake as 0 0.333. 
that's going to be accurate uh, enough. Sine of 2 pi over 5 x. Sine of. Pi x over 5. Putting that x in there in the numerator prevents me from having to put an extra set of parentheses in there. Okay? So first, let's find out what this is at 6. So I reference y1. And I want to know it at t equals 6 seconds. And the answer is 0 0.3169. Let's get that down. That's approximately equal to 0 0.3169 meters per second, which, again, the key is to note that that's greater than zero. So we have positive velocity. OK, how are we going to find the acceleration well we're going to find the slope of the acceleration curve we're going to evaluate that at t equals 6 what does that come out to well go back to the calculator and what we need is what we need is math 8, our variable is going to be x, even though it, in reality it's t, our function is sitting there in the y1 spot, and we are evaluating it at 6 seconds. It's also positive, 0 0.1294. And those units are meters per second squared. And that's also greater than zero. So since the velocity and the acceleration are both positive, we can conclude that the speed is increasing. Here, I realize I forgot to write this down. I'm just going to, for completeness sake, say that that answer is there. And this is increasing. Okay, last question. We've got a racing car. It's going down a straight road at 28 meters per second, which is probably about, I don't know, 60 miles an hour. And then the car accelerates according to some formula. A of t is one half t meters per second squared. So how fast is the car going after five seconds? All right, well, we can handle. Again, we've been given an initial velocity. We've been given acceleration as a function of time. And so we'll find the assigned area under the acceleration curve, not forgetting to add on the initial condition of velocity. And that'll allow us to find the velocity at uh, t equals 5 seconds. I'm using velocity and speed interchangeably in the question in part to familiarize you with the fact that that may well be the way a word problem is written. So even though you understand the distinction between velocity and speed, word problems may not um, do that. They'll simply assume that you understand them to mean positive velocity and therefore positive speed, which is a realistic assumption in the case of a racing car. Racing cars often are not found uh, going 60 miles an hour backwards. Okay, so what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to say that the velocity at 6 is... Did I say 6? No. Velocity at 5 seconds should be equal to the velocity at 0 seconds plus the signed area from 0 to 5 under the velocity curve with respect to time. Let's do that on the calculator. First, we'll put um, y1 in. We'll put 
put it in as one half t. But of course, we're going to use x. And then we'll make use of math 9. We'll write um, 28 plus math 9. We're going to go from 0 up to 5. Our function is going to be y1. And we're doing this with respect to, uh, oh, I put the x in. And we're doing this, let's delete that. We're doing this with respect to t, but we've used x internally to represent t. And so what's our final answer? 34.25 meters per second. meters per second. Again, folks, the real benefit of this kind of a question comes from actually using your calculator, reasoning through the wording, figuring out the appropriate calculation to be done, and then practicing doing those calculations so that you don't make any mistakes.